just one car out of many. Nor did she grow suspicious even when the car came up close behind her. Only when the car moved out to pass her did she glance sideways, and then only because a voice sounded in her ears. Pull over, lady. This is the police. She did not recognize the man. He was young, but then, so was Detective Youngman. Her foot instinctively touched the brake as she veered the car to the side of the road. It was dark along this stretch, the shopping malls and stores were behind them. Cars passed, and no one glanced at them. Joan stopped and sat there with head drooping. It had been a good try, but she should have known that she couldn't get away with it. It had been doomed from the beginning, this wild plan of hers. The other car she noted quickly that the black again had also stopped, and the young man who had spoken to her was walking back toward her. Now that she had a good look at him in the headlights of her car, she grew uneasy. He did not look like a detective, though he was well dressed. There seemed to be a furtiveness about him, the way he sidled toward her and glanced at the cars that were passing them. His eyes seemed too close together, and his lips were small and neat under a thick mustache. He came up to her, said, get out. We'll drive you back. I can't leave the car. My husband rented it. We'll send somebody. He stood aside so she could get out. She walked ahead of him toward the black car. Not until she was very close to it did she realize something was very wrong about all this. The driver of the car turned and grinned at her, and she knew him. He was the man who had been in the motorboat on the waterway, earlier. He had pretended to have motor trouble. He had stood up and taken a long, slow look at her. No, she knew her. She turned to run, but the young man had her by the elbow, was opening the car door with his free hand and starting to shut her in. Let me alone, she screamed. You're not. The young man backhanded her across the face, almost knocking her into the car. He muttered curses under his breath, bent and grabbed her, shut her ahead of him, then got in behind her. Joan crouched on the floor, breathless. Her eyes widened as he brought a revolver out from his belt and shoved the muzzle into her face. One piece out of you, lady, and you're dead. Okay, then. Just keep quiet. W.H. What do you want with me? You're going to pay, lady. And pay good. Her heart came near to stopping. She licked her lips with her tongue, but her tongue was as dry as the rest of her mouth. Janet made the car wheel around her. You have the wrong key person. I'm Joe Joan Pierce, and you're Rhoda. Sure, sure. I am. I am. His big hands caught her across the side of her face again, driving her head sideways. Shut up. Don't talk. What are you waiting for, Manny? Let's get this thing rolling. You sure you can keep her quiet? I'm sure. A hand caught her jaw, and strong fingers dug in. Pain lands through her flesh. Joan whispered and tried to pull away from that grasp. relax, and sank against the back of the front seat. Sarah was alive in her. She knew very well that these men did not intend to let her live. She was surprised she was alive even now. If they had wanted to be rid of her, why hadn't that young man pushed his pistol in her face and then fired, while she had been sitting in the rented car? No. That would have been too open. They wanted to kill her, but they wanted to make it look like an accident. In that way, they felt they would be safe. Joan swallowed against the fear eating in her. She felt the fear of the sin, securely believing that she was upstairs in bed and that he would marry her tomorrow. She could picture his emotions tomorrow morning when he went to wake her and found her bed unslept in. He and the police would search for her then, but it would be too late. Something pressed into her.